If you're interested in a data-driven look at higher education in the United States, please tune in later today on Voice of Rio Grande. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Richard Sachs, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University of Rio Grande and Rio Grande Community College in Southeastern Ohio. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about higher education in the United States. And we're going to provide you with a lot of data and a little bit of analysis. I think one of the most important things about being an American is um, the shared governance that we believe in in this country. And part of that is having an informed electorate. Uh, everybody has um, opinions on things. In higher education, we like to make certain that people have informed opinions, which doesn't necessarily mean that everybody um, is thinking the same way. It certainly does not mean that. It means everybody's thinking as they deem appropriate, but we have to be able to agree on the data that we have. So again, uh, it's just like people say, oh, everybody complains about the weather, but nobody ever does anything about it. A lot of people complain about higher education, but they don't always know the data. So let's talk about the data. First of all, in the United States, um, we, have we have a census every 10 years, and we've done this since 1790. Um, so our last sentence, census was in 2010. And some of you may have already seen that there are advertisements for census takers because that's a limited job. It comes up only once every 10 years for a couple weeks. Um, so that's going to come up again, but we do have estimates. And the estimate of the overall population in the United States is that we're around 323 million people. And of that, a little bit less than 20 million are college students. So you can do the math there and figure out 7% or about one out of every 14 people you see on the street is a college student. What does that mean? That doesn't mean a 19-year-old right out of Animal House with John Belushi. It's, it, it could mean a traditional age kid who is going to school full time. It could be your 70-year-old aunt who is taking a three-credit pottery course at the local community college. Or it could be your ne'er-do-well nephew who is now in a eight credit phlebotomy course to get certification. So it's just anybody who's taken a college course during the year. And if you go back to that slide, or if you have it etched into your memory, you'll see that of those nearly 20 million, about 17 million are undergrad and about 3 million are grad. So in terms of giving the United States population data that's usable, 85% of all college students are undergrads. So if you learn nothing else, if you say, I watched a really interesting half-hour program with some professor from Ohio, if you remember nothing else, just remember that. We're 85% undergraduate. You go to a large graduate university like Ohio State or Michigan, it feels like, wow, there's a law school, med school, you know, graduate arts and sciences. It seems like it's mostly grad school, but that's not always the case. And then there are smaller schools like Johns Hopkins University, a private university founded in Baltimore in 1876 that was founded as a graduate university. And even though Johns Hopkins has about 2,000 undergrads, it has seven or 8,000 graduate students. Most schools aren't like that. There's a lot of undergrad only. There's a lot of community college only. So again, we're dealing with about 85 out of every 100 students is taking undergraduate courses. The other 15, that's everything. That's law school, medical school, MSNs in nursing, MSWs in social work, um, all the graduate arts and sciences. Um, and then if we look at uh, race and ethnicity, um, in what, percent, what percentage of the overall are these various people? American Indians, depending on the data you look at, are between 0.8% and 1.1% of the population. You can see they're 0.7% of the American Indian population. We'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. To what degree is the ethnic or racial class you're in being represented at the same degree in terms of being college seeking? 
Um, Asian Americans, about 6% of the population. Blacks, 12.3%. Pacific Islanders, 0.3%. That's not just Hawaii. That's American Samoa and other places like that. Uh, Hispanic, 16.5%. And white, this is college-going students, 51.1%. Now, the percentages do not add up to 100% for a number of reasons. We're not including international students. We're not including a number of different other categories. <clears throat> and believe it or not, our federal guidelines are you can identify with two or more races if one is Hispanic. So if you're, say, white and black, you can't identify as both those races. You can be Hispanic and white, Hispanic and black, but you can't be white and black. So those are just the federal rules. I don't have a comment on that. I'm just giving you the facts. So again, that, that is uh, the percentage of the college-going adults. So there's a lot, a lot of different ways we get to college. Um, increasingly, there's dual enrollment, what we call College Credit Plus in Ohio, so where you have high school and even middle school students taking college courses while they're fulfilling their middle school and high school. Um, there are students who don't have to worry about money because they're going to get a sports scholarship that will pay for everything if they go to a large Division I school, or they have very wealthy parents, or perhaps they have a bequest from a, a deceased aunt or uncle. But most students are worried about money and how they're going to pay for college. And everybody's worried about quality. You want to have a degree that means something. And everybody wants to be able to go to school. So if we could go to the next slide, which has what we call the iron triangle of higher education, and my thanks to Mike Thompson for helping to, to make that as visual as it is. And for, I'd say, about 15 years, I'm not certain who first used this. Um, to me, it was Provost Chauke Abdallah at University of New Mexico. He's now a vice president at Georgia Tech. But I don't think Chauke created the Iron Triangle. But he was the first person who presented this to me and a bunch of other deans at UNM about a decade ago. And that is... You have these three sides of a triangle in terms of the higher education institution that a student is trying to, to get into. There's access, how easily are you going to be able to get to it, both in terms of where it's located and in terms of um, will they admit you. You know, most of the Ivy League schools are admitting single digit percentages. So they'll admit eight or nine percent. So out of 100 applicants, 92 get rejected. So there's that access. There's also the access of, oh, I was admitted to the Ivy League University, and they offered me some money, but not enough. I can't make it. So there's access in that sense, which also rolls into cost. And then, of course, there's quality. So here is the higher ed um, mantra. You pick two sides of that triangle, and it determines the third. So if we could look at that triangle again, let's say you want something that's high access and high quality, okay? It's going to cost you a lot of money. Or if you want to make sure it's low cost and high access, that may affect the quality. So the idea is you pick two sides of the triangle, it's going to force your hand on the third. And again, this is a very general point, but I, I want us to think about those things because access, cost, and quality are always incredibly important um, when you're thinking about creating or maintaining or improving a higher ed institution. So the next thing we want to look at, and again, the, most of this data is nationwide, although we'll get into some Ohio data in a few minutes. But think about the ethnic or racial um, identification that a student has and then ask yourself is this population going to college in the same numbers that reflect um, its demography in the United States so if we could look at the just represent slide so US demographics now have American Indians at just under 1% so 0.8% of all Americans are American Indian but only 0.7% of American Indians are currently in higher education. So first of all, that number may not be statistically significant. It's only 0.1%. And then the other question is, just because that ethnic sub subgroup is under-enrolled now, it could be that 
most American Indians have degrees already. Now, we know that not to be the case, but do you see the point? You can't just look at the data and automatically say that data point means this. Um, if we move on to the Asian, also on this slide, Asian Americans, I, I, I'm sorry, this is, uh, these are people who identify as Asian. So um, whether they are Asian citizens in an Asian country or whether they are, um, you know, have INS status to live here, if they identify as Asians, that's about 5.4% of the population, but Asians are reflected in 6%, 6.0% of the higher ed enrollment. Now, that kind of supports the stereotype that we have in the United States, right? That Asian Americans are the one ethnic subculture that generally tests above the average, certainly in college going. But keep this in mind, too. Um, stereotypes, although they may often be grounded in true facts, are not statistical facts. And even though um, people who live in parts of the country without large numbers of Asian people may only be interacting with Asian doctors and Asian professors. Um, I can tell you from years of living in San Francisco and in Albuquerque and in Colorado, where there are larger numbers of Asians than in Ohio, I can honestly tell you there are a lot of poor Asians working at, you know, X job or Y job. So again, you see that the share of Asians going into higher ed is higher, but it's not dramatically higher, although it is somewhat higher. Um, next interesting stats, blacks. Again, we used to use the term Negro, that uh, African-American, and now the federal government has gone to black as the term. 12.7% of the demographics, 12.3% of share of higher enrollment. So again, that's a little bit underperforming, but not horribly so. That also triggers another observation that we have to keep in mind, and that is this only shows people enrolled in something. It does not show retention. It does not show persistence. It does not show completion. And unfortunately, African Americans are usually at the bottom of um, different racial categories in terms of college completion. This at least shows, in terms of college attendance, they are getting to college. But it would be interesting to see how those would agree with the completion. And then you, you could focus on that. Okay, we're getting them to campus. We're just not supporting them well enough. Um, Hispanic, and again, Hispanic is a little touchy just because you can be Hispanic and another um, racial identifying category unlike the others. 17.8% of the population in, 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 in my 35 years in higher education, I've, gone, I've seen Hispanic go from 5 to 18% of the U.S. demographics, and that is a growth category and will probably continue. Again, a little bit underrepresented, 16.5%, and again, blacks and Hispanics usually duke it out at the bottom of the completion. So again, we're getting, uh, one of the takeaways I would say is we're getting blacks and Hispanic students to campus almost representative with their part of the population. We're just not getting them to complete. And then the final category I think will be jaw dropping to some people. Whites are 72.6% of demographics and 51.1% of the college population. This is um, white people, um, with, n without much higher education, and that's the category. And so that is quite a, a drop, and that's not something we would have seen 20 or 30 years ago. So that's a relatively new demographic. That's something we can focus on in the future or not. If we go on to the next um, slide, um, if you just were watching uh, movies, you might think that there's nothing but teenagers nowadays. As it is, believe it or not, teenagers are only, or high, high school graduates each year, are only about 1% of the population. This spring, we are expecting 3.4 million new high school graduates. Ohio is expecting 122,000. And this is a key statistic now. Note that a decade from now, we expect a 5% drop in new high school graduates nationwide. Notice that's going to be doubled in Ohio, the percentage drop. 
11.6%. But keep in mind, even with an 11.6% drop, we're looking at 108,000 graduates 10 years from now. That's a lot of kids. So again, this is not something to be discouraged, but this is something we need to look at. And the takeaway point is obvious, isn't it? We're going to have fewer high school graduates, and that problem is going to be exacerbated in Ohio. The drop is 15% in Michigan. The drop is 14% in Pennsylvania. So some of our contiguous states are even worse. Notice our poverty rate is only slightly worse than the national average. Our high school dropout rate is only slightly higher than the national average. And our college going rate for what we would call traditional age college students, 18 to 24, and that is a federal category. Believe it or not, you're a non-traditional student if you're 25 and you're still an undergrad. Even though I would say, a lot of us would say, hey, a 25 or 26 year old undergrad, that's still pretty much a traditional age student. So again, that's something to keep in mind. So again, one takeaway point is, we're gonna have fewer high school students. So if you want to even maintain your enrollment, you either have to draw a higher percentage, what we call yield, a higher yield. So if for every 10 students who applied, you accepted eight, and of those eight, four came, we have to increase our yield and make sure six of them are coming now. That would be an increased yield out of that group. So that's one takeaway, and the other takeaway is pretty obvious too. You have to go into online so that you're not limited by the demographics of your region and you have to go into non-traditional. There's a lot of older people who may need degrees or courses, and that may be a good population for certain colleges. If we go into day of rec days of reckoning, uh, private college closures and consolidations are already a trend in higher education. Institutions feeling particular pr pressure have one or more of the following characteristics. They're in a rural area or a small town. They have small enrollment, which the CIC, the Council of Independent Colleges, defines as 1,100 full-time equivalent or less. For example, this last fall, we had 1,878 full-time students. We had 1,660 FTE, meaning if everybody were taking 12 credits, we would have 1,660 students. So 1,100 FTE if you have a small enrollment. A modest endowment. Endowments for nonprofit higher ed, ed are pools of money that institutions keep, and you generally draw down 5%. Well, I think we're drawing down 4.9% on our very modest endowment. But for example, if you have a $100 million endowment and take a 5% drawdown, that means you have $5 million just to use on your budget, however you want each year. Some of the schools with billion dollar endowments, can you imagine what their bottom line looks like before they even start charging for tuition and room and board and things like that? Um, and a final category um, for small colleges that might be in danger of closing are those Roman Catholic institutions located far from Roman Catholic population centers. Um, that is generally the Northeast and um, metropolitan areas. If we go on to the last slide, this is just a selection of many colleges that have closed. Um, St. Gregory's University, Shawnee, Oklahoma, founded in 1875 by the Benedictine Order of Monks. It closed last summer in 2018. It, it, it was a Catholic university, far from any large urban center or centers of Catholic population. Memphis College of Art in Memphis, Tennessee, founded in 1936. Last decade or so, they aggressively went into summer art camps, bringing little kids to campus during the summer, trying to make money that way. And they also tried to do a lot of continuing ed, both on their campus and elsewhere. Didn't work, they're closing, they're not admitting any more students. It is a requirement, usually, of the regional accrediting bodies that if you close a program, you have to teach it out. And that's true even if you're closing. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't, but that is what the accreditation law is. Grace University, a Christian university of Omaha, Nebraska, founded in 1943, closed in 2018. Wheelock College was a mid-range women's college in the Fenway area of Boston. And it, I, I should have gotten its founding period. It was founded in the 19th century when 
many of the old women's colleges were founded after the Civil War. It's going to merge with Boston University, which is in the area and needs more space. So again, you can close, you can attenuate, you can cut back on your uh, programs, you can try to merge. Right now, Hampshire College, which was an American experimental college started in the 60s with the other colleges in the Connecticut River Valley, that is University of Massachusetts at Amherst, the flagship university in Massachusetts, Mount Holyoke College and Smith College, two of the oldest and wealthiest women's colleges in the country, and Amherst College, one of the oldest and wealthiest men's colleges. Amherst did go co-ed in the 70s. The two women's colleges stayed all female. Hampshire College was started as a consortium of those other four colleges as an experimental college. Hampshire College has a $57 million endowment, and its president announced, this is not on the sheet, uh, but I'll get back to the table in a minute, Hampshire's president announced two weeks ago that Hampshire was looking for partners and would not admit any new students. So the only 70 or so students who will start Hampshire College this fall were either students who were accepted last year and then deferred for a year because they wanted to do something for a year first, or also early admission students. Some of the most prestigious schools, the most selective schools in the country, offer early admission. Um, and that way you commit to the institution if they um, admit you, but and they tell you by December 1, and then you're done until you come to the college next year. So again, I think a lot of small colleges, the same way Wheelock did with BU, will continue to look for uh, mergers. Uh, other possibilities, Marygrove College. Uh, probably the only one in the room who's been at Marygrove College repeatedly. Marygrove um, was founded in 1905. It is on McNichols Avenue, which Detroiters call Six Mile um, in Detroit. It was the women's college that was built a mile away from University of Detroit, the men's college. Of course, University of Detroit, which merged with Mercy College back in the 80s, is now called University of Detroit Mercy, and it went co-ed a long time ago. Back in the 1980s, when I was working at Madonna University in Livonia, Michigan, also the Detroit area, we used to make fun of Marygrove College because they developed, a, they had about 400 women undergrad and about 50 graduate women, and that was it. And they had a beautiful stone mansion behind gates in the Detroit ghetto. And boy, when I went there for Catholic University meetings, it was a beautiful building, but you're in a really bad ghetto there. And what they decided to do was they started what we pejoratively called the Masters in a Box, where you would get a Master of Arts in Teaching. And we were so proud. We brought people to our campus, and we all met interactively. But no, with Marygrove, they'd send you a box in the mail, and you would go through the things in the box and complete your assignments that way. They still have that. They have decided to shut down the undergraduate programs in 2018, and they are keeping that MAT masters in a box, and they'll continue to, however they get that materials, those materials out, I assume they do it electronically now. Those of you who have gotten off the freeway in South Bend thinking, I'd love to see the Notre Dame campus, are probably surprised when you see Holy Cross College right as you get off the freeway there. I know I was thinking, this doesn't look like the way I thought Notre Dame would. Well, it's not. It's Holy Cross College. Um, both Holy Cross College, which is clearly a Catholic college, and Wheeling Jesuit University, which is just up the river about 100 miles from us here, um, they both sold large portions of land that they had to stave off financial crises. And you see colleges doing this. Um, good art collection, you sell it off, and that way you don't have to fire faculty. So, I mean, sometimes those are the difficult decisions that come. Finally, just a few weeks ago, Green Mountain College in Pulteney, Vermont, founded in 1834, is going to close after 185 years. So again, I do not mean to be um, a prophesier of doom. Um, there will still be colleges in the future. There will still be American colleges. I'll even say there's going to be small colleges. But the point I would make is the wealthy small colleges for Ohio, that would be Kenyon, Denison, Worcester. Those colleges will be fine, but there's 56 other private colleges in Ohio, and you see that replicated across the country. 
and schools are going to, colleges are going to have to be relevant and find lots of areas of relevancy in order to remain relevant as um, higher education options in the 21st century. Um, so thank you very much. If you bring out George Harrison's Dobro, um, I could regale you guys with a song. Otherwise, I think I'm off the air until next month. Thanks very much for listening. Um, hope to see you next month.